When did the first UFO appear in the skies over our world? Could it be that alien beings are the wellspring of our evolution? Are there scientific findings that alien life is interacting with life on Earth? Astounding connections between alien beings and the history of humankind in this chapter of UFO Diary. The history of the UFOs continues to be one of the most puzzling riddles facing our world today. What are these things that so many witnesses have seen streaking through the sky? Are they piloted by beings from another planet? And perhaps most importantly, why would extraterrestrial travelers come here? Is there something special about the Earth or the human race that draws these beings to our world? And if so, what is it? Many UFO researchers now believe that the answer to these questions may lie in our own history. One theory, for example, is that alien beings may have suddenly developed a profound interest in us on the day we exploded our first atomic bomb. Did visitors from another world fear that we had then become a threat to other life in the universe? That with our primitive rockets, we might launch devastating weapons at other inhabited worlds? There may be convincing evidence to support this theory. It was, after all, shortly after the development of atomic power in 1945 that the first official flying saucer report was filed. In 1947, private pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying in the mountains above Mount Rainier, Washington. When he landed, he claimed that there were nine silvery disks that he saw following him up there that were going, and he estimated, 1,700 miles an hour. He described the movement of these craft as being like a saucer skipping across water. And the reporters were very excited about this, and one of them coined the term flying saucer, and that took off. But were the nine objects Kenneth Arnold saw really the first UFOs? During World War II, there were the Foo Fighters, uh, luminous objects which would follow bombers on their way to uh, bombing targets in Germany. Or do objects seen in our skies earlier in history suggest the real mission of the alien visitors? Well, in 1896, in uh, California, people began to see what they thought was the solution. A uh, phantom airship appeared over uh, Sacramento in uh, November of that year. They saw this big searchlight and an object behind it that presumably had propellers or wings or something of the sort. It moved into uh, the rest of the country, particularly in April of 1897, and you would get any number of descriptions. Uh, one. The illustration from Minnesota shows something that looks like a, an aerial country ham with lights. Then there's another one from Texas that looks like a swallowtail football with bat wings. But there were several thousand reports made during uh, 1896 and 1897 from all over the country of this uh, strange object. And the newspapers over the next uh, two months uh, gave all sorts of illustrations of what this uh, supposed uh, secret invention looked like. Is it possible that the phantom airships were in fact the same kind of UFOs seen by witnesses today? If so, we may find we must look even further back in history to find the first UFOs. Okay, over here, I have some drawings that they're over 400 years old. Recent discovery of documents over 400 years old have many skeptics re-examining their position on these ancient witnesses of UFO. In the 16th century self-flying saucer? Whoever did these drawings apparently saw something. There were sightings in the 16th century as well, 
and these were usually ascribed to religious portents, signs from God. In August of 1566, in Basel, Switzerland, these large black globes floated in the sky, and in April 1561, these objects appeared over Nuremberg. When we enter into the 16th and 17th centuries, we enter into a golden age of uh, UFO-type sightings. John Calvin said that a miracle happened every day. In one case from 1600, you can see uh, uh, a depiction of, of what they thought burning beams in the sky looked like, probably much more artificial looking in the illustration than they really were to observe, but they were the kind of thing that uh, people became quite uh, excited about in those days. Will we ever find the very first UFO sighting? How far back into human history can we search without learning of strange objects seen in the skies? People have seen some kind of strange objects in the sky for as long as we have any, any re human records. Uh, we can look back to Roman historians like Livy who would uh, report that uh, an object like a flying shield came passing through the sky. Is this a description 2,000 years old of the same UFOs seen in our century? There are descriptions of UFOs in documents even older than the Romans. Do you have anything even older? Uh, if you wanted to... Prior to the 16th century, most written records concerned religious problems. And here, the texts abound with rich descriptions of visitors from the skies. It's called the Mahabharata. The Hindu epic poem, the Mahabharata, tells the events that happened about 1200 B.C. Uh, one of the heroes of the poem is described as going up into heaven this way. On a gigantic beam of light which shone like the sun and whose noise was like the thunder of a thunderstorm. A liftoff. Whoever wrote this witnessed some kind of a ship blasting off over 3,000 years ago. Well, it's just a poem. You, you don't think that uh, men from outer space would have left more than a few drawings or a few poems. Did the author of that ancient text witness what we would call today a blast-off? Supposing for a moment that space travelers have visited Earth for thousands of years, would they not have left some proof of their existence, something besides stories and drawings of strange objects in the sky? Many UFO researchers believe that exactly this kind of evidence can be found on the plains of Nazca in southern Peru. These lines are probably 2,000 years old, but the resemblance to a modern airport is quite striking. In some cases, um, the Nazca lines, for instance, they're described as being runways but they're simply uh, long, straight lines gouged in the desert, and there's no way any kind of an airplane could land on them and survive. Are the markings on the plains of Nazca the remains of the busy airport they resemble? If so, they suggest a large volume of traffic, perhaps hundreds of space vessels coming and going. If the alien spacecraft uh, then in use are like the ones they're using now, they would not have needed runways. Perhaps these are some kind of navigational markings because uh, they're visible only from the air. If so, what were the interplanetary travelers bringing to Earth, or what were they taking away? Could it be that they had a specific plan that included the inhabitants of Earth? The astounding answers when UFO Diaries return. If travelers from a distant planet have been visiting our world for centuries, the possibility exists that they were not here as casual observers. Could the alien visitors have had some deep interest in human development? And if so, how much of our history was affected by beings not of this Earth? I believe that there is substantial evidence that we were visited in ancient times by beings who wanted to help us to advance and progress. In Istanbul, for example, there is a strange map which had been made uh, by the 16th century Turkish cartographer Piri Reis. And you say the Piri Re map was made in 1513? If it has been dated accurately, this map was made in 1513, 
Only 21 years after Columbus reached the Americas. Oh, I a complete map for that time. They show that Antarctica is a continent. A fact we didn't learn until the 19th century. I mean, look, this map shows mountains in Antarctica. And this map even shows mountains there that were not discovered until the 20th century. Did this early cartographer get his information from someone who had seen our world from outer space? And is it significant that Piri Reese's extraordinary map came into being just at the time European civilization was beginning a vast expansion? Could alien beings somehow have taken an interest in the course of human progress? If so, their involvement may have been vast and far-reaching, including many scientific advances literally handed down from the heavens. If you have doubts that some culture far in advance of ours has been helping us along, you should look at some of the cultures of Mexico and Central America. You'll see, for example, a pyramid in Yucatan called El Castillo, the castle. Twice a year, exactly on the spring and autumn solstice, the sun aligns across those steps in such a way as to cast an eerie shadow, the image of a giant snake crawling down the pyramid. The snake represents Kukulkan, the Mayan god who supposedly created all life on Earth. The local legend has it that Kukulkan himself ordered the pyramid at Chichen Itza built in this way. But why would the serpent god command such a structure to be built? And why was it carefully constructed in such a way that the serpent image appears, as if by magic, twice a year? The Mayan pyramid works as a calendar. It predicts th exactly 365 and one quarter days. For people who had no other calendar, this signal of planting and harvesting season meant life and death. I believe they had somebody to help them figure this all out. If this remarkable structure were a gift from the gods, as their legend has it, then these super beings were indeed deeply concerned with the local culture. It would seem they wanted these people to thrive and survive. We have to consider this. Around 600 AD, they abandoned their cities, crops, and everything and moved north. There was no war, plague, or famine. They simply moved as though someone had told them to move. Was the Mayan nation deliberately raised in this controlled environment and then set out to share its advanced knowledge with the rest of the region? Isn't it more reasonable to believe that the Mayan people were simply more advanced than we've thought? That they achieved scientific wonders without any outside help? We have to take into account the stories told by so many of the native cultures of how their races were visited by beings who came down from the sky to visit and help them. Is that it? That's it. Still here. Take, for example, this carving in the Mexican temple at Palenque. It is supposedly related to that culture's stories of how it came to be, of how they survived all these years. I'll have to admit, it does look familiar. The resemblance to a modern space traveler is very striking, but might this not also be mere coincidence? If so, then the mystery only grows deeper when we learn that many researchers believe this sculpture represents Kukulkan, who came down from the sky and gave mankind many technological advances, including the calendar. And yet many researchers remain unconvinced that these artifacts prove mankind has been frequently visited by extraterrestrials. Skeptics claim that this so-called evidence indicates a technology very much like ours in the 20th century, with smoke and flames, airport runways, pressure suits, and so on. All of this looks like the kind of technology we use today. We Could beings from another world have made visits to Earth using rockets and planes similar to those we use today? If so, they would have to have come from somewhere nearby. It seems improbable that beings light years away would drop in on us, but visitors from one of our neighboring worlds, that's something else. But if that is true, which neighboring world? Could it be that there is another planet, one we have yet to learn about? We'll find out when UFO Diaries return. For a time, imaginative people of all kinds believe that intelligent life might exist on some of Earth's nearest neighbors. In fact, many people still associate UFOs with Mars or Venus. But now we know that conditions on the other planets in our system make it very unlikely that any kind of recognizable life could exist on these inhospitable worlds. 
And so the notion of Earth being visited by creatures from nearby planets now seems utterly impossible. Or is it? Zechariah Sitchin has dedicated years of study to the belief that this world's most ancient visitors came from a planet in our own system. I believe that the answer to most of our questions about extraterrestrial visitors lies in the ancient records of the Sumerians. The Sumerian civilization emerged in what is now Iraq about 6,000 years ago. They provided the basis for every great culture that followed them, starting with the Babylonians and Assyrians and on and on, up to our own modern society. Every aspect of civilization that we consider essential had its first in Sumer. Writing and mathematics, the wheel, the kiln, brick making, high-rise buildings, kingship, codes of law, astronomy, and much, much more. Many cultures struggled for centuries to advance and to develop. But the Sumerian civilization appeared almost overnight as if planted there. The Sumerians had detailed knowledge of the solar system thousands of years before modern astronomy. How could they have known? Most amazing was the Sumerian knowledge of astronomy. They knew of all the planets we know of today, described them in texts, and even depicted them correctly by location and size. The astronomer Copernicus is often said to be the first to prove that the planets orbited around the sun and that Earth was one of those planets. That was in 1543. But the Sumerians said the same thing 5,500 years earlier. Even more amazing, they described Uranus and Neptune as blue-green twins. Modern science was unable to closely observe these planets until 1986 with the flyby mission of the Voyager probe that found them to be blue-green twins exactly as the Sumerians had described them thousands of years earlier. Was this a fortunate choice of words for an imaginative Sumerian writer? Or was it based on information from someone who had seen Uranus and Neptune at close range? And does this mean we found the first UFO 6,000 years in the past? The Sumerian texts, such as this one, explicitly state that all their advanced knowledge came from those whom they called Anunnaki, literally meaning those who from heaven to earth came. But where did these visitors come from? Did the Sumerians leave any clues to the origin of the Anunnaki? Ancient Sumerian writings describe a planet orbiting the sun on an oblique to the others and of such a long orbit that it only makes one complete circuit every 3,600 of our years. They call this world Nibiru, and it was from that world that the Anunnaki came. If this theory is correct, it suggests how an inhabited planet, called Planet X by astronomers, could have once been close enough to Earth for the Anunnaki to reach us with some kind of short-range vehicles. Does this explain how alien explorers might have come to Earth in spaceships not too different from those we have today? And if there is a planet such as the Sumerian texts describe, has it not passed by Earth time and time again? My study of history shows several time periods during which mankind's knowledge and progress seem to have suddenly leaped forward. And they do seem to be about 3,600 years apart. To me, this is highly suggestive that the Anunnaki have taken advantage of their proximity to Earth on several occasions and have helped us to advance and progress every time. Has human progress been periodically boosted by the race that started our earliest civilization? Or are we part of a cosmic science experiment? But why would an alien race be so willing, even eager, 
to help advance the course of human progress. Could it be that we are somehow part of them? The astounding answers when UFO Diaries returns. We're exploring the theory that travelers have come to Earth throughout the ages, arriving from a hidden planet in our own solar system. Are we any closer to an explanation of why these ancient visitors would be so eager to help mankind progress and develop? It seems very likely that these space travelers thousands of years ago wished for our race to survive for the same reason we wish our children to survive. Maybe it was these beings who seeded this planet with their own life forms and we may be, in a real sense, their children. If that is true, we've found the first UFO, and it's the one that brought us here to this world we call our home. In fact, this theory may be supported by the biblical account of the creation of humankind. The sixth chapter of Genesis tells us the Nephilim took the daughters of men as wives, and these human women bore children to them, and these were the mighty men who were of old. Could this refer to the alien visitors the Sumerians called the Anunnaki? Did men from another world mate with human females, producing hybrid offspring? Yes, the evidence is very convincing. We may well be mixed breed descendants of humans and extraterrestrials. In fact, according to ancient records, the females whom the Nephilim married were offspring of Adam, himself created by an earlier genetic manipulation. Wait a minute. Look at this. It's DNA. Could it be that the ancient Sumerians actually knew something about genetics? We have only recently discovered the key to our genetic structure, the twisting coils of DNA. But here, here is the same depiction on a Sumerian artifact from 5,000 years ago. It illustrates the process by which the Anunnaki jumped the gun on evolution and created Homo sapiens. Is this the ultimate discovery in the study of UFOs? In finding the earliest alien visitors to Earth, have we also revealed that they are our ancestors? Yes. We are partly of the same genetic makeup, created in their image and after their likeness. Does this explain why ancient depictions of visitors from the sky often resemble human beings? Have we traced the first UFO and discovered ourselves? The modern UFO belief system, um, in a way, has become part of uh, modern American society's creation myth. Uh, you have these all-powerful be beings um, who are responsible for everything we do not understand. Um, in a way, they're equivalent to Zeus and Hercules in Greek uh, and Roman mythology. So in a way, we're s they are just the latest chapter in the great um, human mythological story. Will these stories ever be confirmed as truth? Will the ancient astronauts return to check on our progress? We can only wait and see. And meanwhile, continue puzzling over these strange clues in the pages of the UFO Diaries. <laughs>